The eyes have it. The eyes have it. <clears throat> the next item of business is the further consideration stage budget number two bill. And I call uh, the Minister of Finance, Conor Murphy, to move the bill. Moved. Last can call it. As no amendments have been tabled, there is no opportunity to discuss the Budget No. 2 Bill today. Members will, of course, be able to have a full debate in the final stage. The further consideration stage of the Bill is therefore concluded. The Speaker has taken advice on the Bill after the consideration stage, and as there were no amendments to the Bill today, the Speaker is content that the Bill may properly proceed to its final stage in accordance with the requirements of Standing Orders uh, 39 and Section 10 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998. So the next item of business is the final stage of the Budget No. 2 Bill, and I call the Minister to move the final stage. Moved. Last count order. The final stage of the Budget No. 2 Bill has been moved. The Business Committee has agreed that there should be no time limit to this debate, and I call the Minister to open the debate on the Bill. Minister. Today's final stage debate concludes this unusual step in the financial legislative process for the 2020-21 year. As I explained in the debates which took place last week, this further vote on account is an unprecedented step. The circumstances that have been brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic could not have been predicted by anyone when we considered the last budget bill earlier in the year. The Executive has acted quickly and decisively to address this emergency as it evolved. In the first few weeks of this financial year, I have announced over £1.2 billion to strengthen the health service, support business and protect the vulnerable. As an Executive, we are continuing to plan to and respond to the situation. The Assembly's normal legislative process was not designed to deal with such a rapidly changing situation, but we have been able to ensure that departments will have access to the cash that they require to deliver vital services. I wish to express my gratitude once again to the Finance Committee, who acknowledged the unique circumstances that we have found ourselves in this year. Accelerated passage and the additional step of suspending Stanton Order 42.5 was essential to allow the continuation of public services. Even when the Bill passes this final stage of the Assembly, there are some other steps to be completed before Royal Assent is secured, and I have written to the British Secretary of State to ensure this is expedited as soon as possible. I thank all of the departmental committees and indeed all members for the level of scrutiny that they have been able to bring to this process in the time available. I know some members have raised concerns about the limited opportunity for scrutiny of this Bill, and I assure all members I will bring the main estimates and a further Budget Bill to the Assembly in early autumn. There will be every opportunity for members to debate the Executive's up-to-date 2020-21 expenditure plans at that time. Last can call to conclude, this is the final stage of the legislative process for this Bill and the further vote of account it provides. I now look forward to hearing any final thoughts from the members on this important piece of legislation. I now call the Chairperson of the Finance Committee, Mr Stephen Aiken. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank you very much indeed for the Minister for his remarks. Uh, as members will be aware, the Budget Bill before the House today provides the statutory authority to allow public expenditure to continue until the main estimates for 2021, which are voted on by the Assembly. And as the Minister has mentioned, we fully anticipate this will be by early September. We are acutely aware that the need for an earlier than anticipated Budget Bill is necessary as a result of the increased spending from the current COVID pandemic. The Committee for Finance took evidence on the Budget Bill 2020 from the Department of Finance officials on the 23rd of May. As I alluded to during the debate at second stage, the absence of this bill would have significant consequences on the ability of departments to respond to the challenges being faced across our society. As members know, Budget Bills typically pass under the Accelerated Passage Procedure in order to expedite the process and provide the necessary authority for departmental spending. However, as I indicated during the second stage debate, the Committee has a specific scrutiny and consultation role in relation to budget bills. It is only when this happens that the Committee can satisfy itself that there has been appropriate consultation with it on the public expenditure proposals contained in the bill. This is a fundamental requirement. 
on the basis of which the, consider, the commit, consider, com, committee considers whether it is content to grant accelerated passage. Just as importantly, there is a responsibility in departments to provide timely, relevant and accurate information to their committees with transparency and openness. Whilst the Committee for Finance has arrived at a position where the Department of Finance, where we are being afforded, mostly, the opportunity for consultation and scrutiny at both departmental level and executive level, that has not, Mr. Speaker, Deputy Speaker, been the experience of all committees and departments. This openness and transparency is necessary to afford the committees the opportunity to effectively scrutinise depart departmental spending proposals and understand the rationale for their intended approach. It also affords the Committee for Finance the opportunity to understand the position of each committee on the priorities of their departments. Having developed temp templates to support scrutiny by committees, it was disappointing to hear from both the Deputy Chairperson of the Finance Committee and Chair of the Justice Committee that the Committee for Justice did not receive the completed template form from the Department of Justice, but had to rely on papers sent to the Committee for Finance to understand what was going on within the Department for Justice. I want to make it clear that in future the Committee for Finance will work to ensure that all committees receive the information they need to undertake appropriate financial scrutiny. And I would ask the Minister to make it clear to his executive colleagues that he supports me in doing so, and indeed all the committees in this, in this Assembly. As I have previously acknowledged, the Committee welcomes the engagement from the Department in relation to the Bill. After reviewing the Hansard from last week's supply resolution and second stage debate, it was good to see some healthy debate and validity of points that were raised in the course of the business. Mr Deputy Speaker, I believe we are now entering a pivotal phase that requires us to design and deliver a credible plan over short to medium term to help us cope as best as we can to the challenges that we all recognise we are going to face. That indeed should be our collective aim. At its meeting tomorrow, the Committee will be considering a number of important matters and options to support ongoing and effective scrutiny at a departmental and cross-cutting strategic level. These include options that will aim to support and promote economic activity at a strategic level using levers such as procurement, borrowing, the use of financial transactions capital, and how we can make use of these levers in the future through continued committee and assembly scrutiny. From a departmental perspective, the committee will also be interested in the targeted rate support to those most adversely affected by the pandemic but also in identifying where further efficiencies can be made through public sector reform to enable us to pull ourselves out of this COVID pandemic. Assuming this bill passes and receives royal assent, it will then become the Budget No. 2 Act Northern Ireland 2020. But of course, Mr Minister, that is not the end of the scrutiny rules of committing. Monitoring rounds are an integral part of the role of committees in scrutinising how this legislation is implemented through the scrutiny of public expenditure by departments in the course of the financial year. This week, committees should be considering their department's position for the June monitoring round in advance of monitoring returns being submitted to the Department of Finance Public Spending Directorate. It was my intention from this platform to urge all scrutiny committees to take the opportunity at the June monitoring round to explore in depth with their departments exactly what pressures are being faced the details of bids, the rationale of any movement of resource, and the rationale for retention of resources when spent to date has been less than anticipated. The in-year monitoring process is a critically important opportunity for departments to identify any reduced requirements to support the executive and reallocating resources in-year. It is also an important opportunity for committees to ensure that this happens. This, in turn, will maximise the resources available and minimise the risk of money being lost to the Treasury at the end of the financial year. Unfortunately, the Department of Finance has informed the Committee that due to an exercise to look at reprioritised measures to fund pressures arising from COVID-19, it will not be in a position to provide the Committee with details of its June monitoring position at this week's meeting. While the Minister and his officials may think that this is appropriate, However, the deadline for departments providing information to PSD has not been moved. 
This suggests that departments are being asked to bypass committees and submit their monitoring returns to PSD in advance of any committee scrutiny. I have asked the Department of Finance's officials to attend tomorrow's meeting of the Finance Committee to outline the process being undertaken in the reprioritise ex exercise and they explain why they cannot provide oral evidence on June monitoring at this stage. I also want to ask the Minister to clarify if he intends to put back the deadline for submission to departmental monitoring returns so as to provide committees with the opportunity to consider these in advance. And in view, Minister, of the latitude with which this Assembly has facilitated the Minister and other departments, this should be the very least that we all expect. But on the basis of the Bill, on behalf of the Committee for Finance, we support the Bill. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Paul Free. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, for calling me. And, and I thank the, uh, the chairperson of the Finance Committee uh, for his contribution here today and, and for reinforcing uh, the issue around transparency and accountability and the scrutiny that is placed on our shoulders to ensure that we pass legislation that is fit for purpose. A minister may well bring a bill to this House, but it is this Assembly that passes the legislation. Uh, so we have a critical role, as do scrutiny committees. And we are in unique times, there is absolutely no doubt about that. And things are fast moving, there is absolutely no, no doubt about that. But this is more of a time to scrutinise further and deeper into the legislation that this House passes. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I am tremendously worried today in this House when we have all heard what the Chairperson of the Finance Committee has said around scrutiny. He has quite aptly raised the issue that I raised last week in the other stage of the bill around the Justice Department and the way they have treated the Justice Committee, of which I sit on also. But if I, know, if I knew what I now know now, I'm not even sure I would support the Department of Finance in accelerated passage of this bill. Now, I know it's usually the norm that a budget bill would receive accelerated passage for good reason. But I have really grave concerns about the transparency of these departments, of the secrecy of which they are still conducting business, and the way they are treating scrutiny committees with disdain. We have raised issue upon issue in the committee. We have done our job in the Finance Committee. We have asked questions which are deep, meaningful, not because we want to be awkward, not because we want to be troublesome, but because we want to do our job thoroughly and efficiently and effectively, so that the scrutiny committees can not only be a scrutinizer to departments, but can be of assistance and a guidance and a support to the departments and the ministers. And I must say, Mr Deputy Speaker, I am aggrieved today and really concerned about the stances taken by the Department of Finance around financial and budgetary matters. Mr Deputy Speaker, you will recall the, the debates we have had and the media interest in the information around the field PPE order for China. The Scrutiny Committee asked for all emails concerning this issue. It is a budgetary matter in a, in a crisis that we are in that will affect the budget no end in the coming months and, in fact, years, probably. And when the, the committee asked for all emails concerning this issue, we received a raft of emails which could be easily itemised and timelined. And we realised that there was two days where there was no emails, the 30 and the 30th, 31st, sorry, 30th and the 31st of March. So we asked the question, was there no emails those days? And if there was, why haven't we saw them? Why haven't we got them? 
And we've had a response just right on the limit of deadline. And that response was from the minister himself. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, it states, and the minister states, and I quote, the email exchanges between officials over the 30th and the 31st of March in connection with the order essentially relates to volumes, to products, to specifications and pricing. These exchanges were not regarded by officials as relevant to the committee's original request. The original request was for all, all emails in connection to this issue. Not some, not a win, all, all emails. The Minister says the officials didn't think we wanted to see them because they were all about dry stuff like volumes, products, specifications and pricing. Every single one of those emails which we have read were about volumes, products, specifications and pricing. What is the difference? When a scrutiny committee asks for all emails, we expect to get all emails. It is not up to an official or a minister to decide what the committee should get or what the committee would like to see. We would like to see all emails when we ask for all emails. So I am very aggrieved today, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we are in front of this, we are in front of this Minister, this Department and in this House to pass very important legislation, an exhilarated passage in a way that we have never done before because of the second vote and account. And the Department can't even furnish the scrutiny committee with the emails that I had requested. How long do we have to wait? And when the Minister gave us that explanation as to why the officials didn't send us those emails over those two days, he didn't even furnish us with those emails. So we are still being withheld those emails. Better than that, Mr Deputy Speaker, a BBC Freedom of Information request was issued on the same lines with the same similar requests. And the Department of Finance has refused that freedom of information. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is serious business that we conduct in this Assembly. And every single piece of legislation that we pass will affect every single person in our country, not least a vote on account and a budget bill. Yet the very people who should have first sight of these things in a scrutiny committee are refused access to those emails. That cannot take place. We were promised not about not going back to business as usual. But yet what I see is even more secrecy in our departments, even more subterfuge, whereby they're given an explanation because it's too dry, too factual for a scrutiny committee. Really? Is that where we're at in this place? Is that what we're going to pass here today? And that is totally and utterly unacceptable and cannot take place. So I, as an individual MLA, cannot and will not support accelerated passage anymore for any further legislation that comes before this House or a committee. Nor will I play ball with officials when they want to break deadlines, as the Chair has already alluded to with regards to passing things down the road, cans down the road with regards to the Scrutiny Committee, but yet not, not uh, changing deadlines for committees to scrutinise the works of the departments. That is unacceptable. And that rot will creep in to every single department in this place and will affect transparency and accountability to the point where we, even in this House, cannot get a, few, a view, panoramic view of what's being conducted by our officials, by our ministers, in our departments. That cannot take place. I will play no part in that, and nor should any MLA worth their salt and value their job and have a personal pride in the scrutiny role which they play to scrutinise the departments and to support, to guide and advise. That's not the place we want to be. And I am aggrieved to stand here today to talk about these issues because we were promised a better place. 
We were promised that the permits would be more accountable. There would be no secrecy. Yet we have ministers and departments on a weekly basis now preventing the work of the scrutiny committees, trying to hold up the work of the scrutiny committees. And it is unacceptable. It cannot take place. It should not take place. And I will play no part in that. I expect to see those emails, as does the rest of the committee. And if we do not see the emails, then we will compel witnesses. And it won't be ministers and permanent secretaries. We'll compel the very people who wrote and constructed the emails. And, yeah. um, lightning, um, and may well be valid. I'm at a loss to know what to do with the budget bill. circumstances uh, regarding the budget bill uh, and I am allowing uh, a degree of uh, flexibility around the issues that he's making but he does need to return to the subject. I thank you Mr Deputy Speaker and I, and I, I, I take heed of your warning and your ruling on this and it's everything to do with this budget bill. It's everything to do with this vote on account. This very peculiar second vote on account if the department can't even furnish emails that exist, that we know exist, where are we? Where are we all in this assembly when it comes to scrutiny? It makes a joke of this place. It really does. It destroys the credibility of this assembly. It destroys the credibility of the scrutiny committees. And it destroys the credibility of democracy itself. And that's something what I will guard very carefully. Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, yes I, yes, I will. I thank the member for giving way. I would like to endorse everything he said uh, to date about scrutiny and accountability and openness. And you did say that uh, we were promised a no return to the status quo. And the idea that civil servants and ministers will decide what is and is not of interest to committees is not only wrong, it's deeply shocking in a post-RHI environment. And what you've said has everything to do with this bill because it has everything to do with everything we do in this House. And I commend you for making the point. I thank I think the member for the, the intervention. And I agree 100 per cent with him. And I'm glad that he supports me in this. And I suspect every single MLA in this House should. Because this is where we need to get to be. We need to get to a place where there is total transparency and openness between departments and the MLAs that sit on these benches, irrespective of party politics or what party you're from. This is our job as MLAs to scrutinise legislation and to scrutinise policy within our committees. And if we can't do that, or worse still, we're prevented from doing that by a minister and by a department and by officials, we are in a very grave place. And I thank the member for his contribution. So to get back to this bill, we have no choice, really, because bills need to be paid and money needs to flow. But departments need to do so much better, including the Department of Finance. And if we have to compel uh, officials to come before our committees, then we will do so. And we will get to the truth by hook or by crook, whether it takes us a week or a month or a year. We won't let this drop. I won't let this drop. I want to see everything so that I can judge things on my own. With the information in front of me, nobody should decide what information we get and what information we don't get, except for the committee itself or the individual members on it. It's unacceptable to think in this day and age, ever, ever, after everything that we have been through, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that a department, any department, can stop information flowing to the scrutiny committee, preventing information going to the scrutiny committee. It is unacceptable, unjust and diabolical. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I call Gemma Dolan. Um, as a member of the Committee for Finance, we have been kept informed on the financial resources that are necessary to support departments and the need for the bill to complete the necessary stages swiftly. While recognising that this isn't ideal and the Minister himself has acknowledged that this is a very unusual step, 
we need to be realistic about the consequences of not progressing the legislation in this way. The unusual nature of this measure is reflective of the uncertainty that the COVID crisis has brought with it. Our block grant, which in real terms is £360 million below pre-austerity levels, has left us with health, education, infrastructure and other sectors starved of the resources that they so badly need on a day-to-day -day basis, not to mention in the midst of a global pandemic. And for the way the Minister has handled all of this must be commended. Since the outset of this crisis, the Minister and his officials have fought to protect livelihoods. He has also ensured that resources have been made available to assist those most in need. All of that has been done, as I said, in the context of a global health pandemic, which brings not only consequences for the health and well-being of our loved ones, but also very difficult economic consequences. This budget bill basically provides authority for departments to continue to spend until the detailed main estimates can be debated later in the year. And as I have already said, the consequences of not progressing this legislation are dire. Gormay Ovid. I call Matthew Toole. Thank you, um, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, this is another debate on authorising spending um, uh, in which we will support the authorisation of the spending, but I'm afraid lament the um, lack of scrutiny that we've been able to do. Um, I and my party will support um, the passage of the bill, and um, as I have done in the past, I would commend the Minister for and his officials for the speed with which they have um, uh, been able to disperse funds in the midst of this crisis. I think it's worth saying, uh, particularly I am a former civil servant, um, uh, civil servants here have worked very hard to make things happen at a rate of knots that they would not normally have done. Um, so it's worth putting that on the record. Um, but having said that, and following on actually from the fairly strong remarks that Mr Frew made. He and I don't agree on all that much, but there are certain things where we um, occasionally uh, find uh, some agreement. I think he's broadly right that we um, need to increase the scrutiny that we are doing collectively as an Assembly and specifically on uh, finance. I think possibly, hopefully, the Minister himself would agree that we need to have much greater scrutiny in terms of our budgetary um, processes going forward. And part of the reason for that is not just about a reaction to the RHI scandal, important though that is, and shaping the entire context of this mandate uh, as it should, uh, given the um, really collapse in public trust that that scandal uh, prompted. Um, there is also the, frankly, fundamental question, which is that the Northern Ireland um, Assembly really, uh, first of all, we have a mandatory coalition in the executive under power sharing. Um, we also have uh, through that very few means of setting strategic priorities. One of them is the programme for government process. We don't have an agreed one yet. And the other one that connects to the programme for government process is via our um, budgetary allocation and how we do that. So the, the Department of Finance and the Minister of Finance are, um, in a sense, disproportionately important to the strategic um, uh, priority setting and delivery of the Northern Ireland institutions. So it's not just important that we do more scrutiny of... Um, executive spending, though that is really, really important, and I'll come on to a little bit of that in a couple of moments' time. It's also important that we see, and sorry to labour this point, a more joined up and strategic approach to government. Um, while, as I said, it is welcome that departments, officials uh, and occasionally ministers have acted quickly in relation to dealing with the COVID-19 crisis, sometimes, to be perfectly honest, they've acted a little too quickly, and they've acted uh, certainly too quickly in terms of public communication, and that has led to a, um, a sense that occasionally we, we're, we're engaging in pop-up policy and we're getting back to some of the habits that we, um, that we were unfortunately uh, renowned for as an institution um, in the earlier part of this decade. So we need to get away from that. We need a joined-up programme for government and we need a budgetary process which uh, is connected to that. Um, as I said, the budget that was um, tabled to the Assembly last month was slightly inconsistent. It referred occasionally to the programme for government, presumably the 2016 programme for government, and those headings. Some departments referred to them. I think DERA did. Others departments didn't refer to them at all. So that sense of slightly confused priority setting is something that we need to address, notwithstanding the fact that COVID-19 has shaped everything. Just to move on, uh, to repeat some of my own um, hobby horses uh, about um, the need for long-term fiscal priority setting. I discussed it yesterday in terms of our um, uh, our, the, the resolution, Keith Archibald's uh, resolution or um, motion on economic recovery, the importance of 
a new approach to our fiscal policy making in Northern Ireland, uh, something that I think could be guided by uh, the creation of a fiscal commission uh, uh, in connection to the, and in, in collaboration with the fiscal council that the new decade new approach document set out. I would hope that the minister is in a position to give us um, an indication or an update today on how we're doing with that work, because as we come through COVID, um, actually we need to um, strike while the iron's hot in terms of setting up some of these institutions and, and, and putting down the foundations for um, for, for agreement of how we first of all do long term, first short term recovery, uh, and we still, as, as others in the Assembly ha have pointed out, we still don't have that recovery plan from the Department of Economy, but also how we agree a medium and long term set of priorities. So, um, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have um, uh, laboured on a few points that I've laboured before. I think they're worth putting on the record again. Um, I will briefly say that um, I'll remind the, the, the Finance Minister, since I'm here, that it would cost a very small amount of money for us to support local media, a very, very small amount of money. It would be a, a relatively, um, not quite a rounding error. These are, these are important sums of money, particularly um, uh, in the context of, of, of constraints, but um, that local media is extremely important to our local communities. And if we lose it, and, and we could lose quite a chunk of it through this crisis, um, uh, we probably won't get it back. Um, so I think at that, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, having repeated myself a few times and having raised a few important points and putting them back on the record, I will um, uh, yield the floor to others. I call Andrew Muir. Um, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, we have debated a lot of these issues, so I'll, I'll try to be brief and, as the previous speaker says, try to avoid uh, repetition. Um, the last party will vote for the Budget Bill today. We do so because the departments urgently require additional resources. And we do so in anticipation of the main estimates being delivered in the autumn. Um, the implications of not passing the budget bill today is something I'm not prepared to contemplate, nor is the Alliance Party at this moment, uh, where the society needs stability from government and needs properly funded public services. Uh, this is my first experience of a budget process as a member of the Assembly, and I want to thank the officials who have worked under extraordinary circumstances to get us to this point. The budget process thus far has indeed been extraordinary. However, Mr Deputy Speaker, I sincerely hope that next year's budget process is nothing like this one. I hope that then we will long have been working towards a strategic economic recovery plan delivered by the Executive. I hope that we are agreeing a multi-year budget for a multi-year programme for government, and I hope that there will be sufficient time for thorough scrutiny by the statutory committees. These are not nice-to-haves for the next Budget Bill. They are, in fact, essential requirements. Mr Deputy Speaker, the onset of COVID-19 makes this a financial year like no other. But the underlying challenges to our financing of our public services remain exactly the same and cannot be ignored. The time for ministers to tackle the £800 million a year cost of division is now. The time to implement Bengoa is now. The time for an independent review on education is now. The time for public sector reform is now. And the time to invest in our infrastructure is now. These issues have been kicked down the, uh, the road for quite a long time. Now there is very little road left. and We need to make sure that we are using our public finances correctly and to the best effect. Uh, these issues need to be faced up to, because without doing that, the, the, we are going to end up having public services which are not sufficiently funded to get us through this crisis and towards a recovery and a renewal. COVID-19 is not the reason to put these back for, uh, reforms on the back burner. Quite the opposite. These reforms can no longer wait. Um, these, 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 reforms can no more afford, these reforms can no more afford to wait than the 300,000 people on our hospital waiting lists. This newly restored Assembly has the chance to transform public services in the midst of what should be a green recovery. We owe it to the people of Northern Ireland who have risen to the challenges over the past few months in so many ways to deliver. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call John O'Dowd. Uh, last um, and this is the first opportunity I've had to speak in regards uh, the process of this budget bill. And I was thinking in regards uh, the, the entire process, and I accept members' concerns around accelerated passage around any piece of legislation. I fully agree that committees need to scrutinise, and committees will have to get their game face on 
uh, in the weeks and months that follow, uh, because we are in, in my opinion, I think the opinion of many is in for a very, very difficult period, uh, financially, economically, uh, and to get the best out of our resources, our limited resources then, committees are going to have to be to the fore of that. Uh, I, I don't know the validity of, of, of Mr. Frew's arguments. Um, my, my concern was and that he was raising the argument was the, the relevance to uh, this debate, though I suspect some of his comments were directed to somebody who's not in the chamber rather than somebody who is in the chamber. But that's not, not of my concern. Uh, the budget. In most legislators, when the, when the, when the finance minister comes in or, uh, to deliver the budget, it's about a number of matters. But core to it is taxation. What levels the minister is going to set taxation at, where he or she plans to collect taxation, where he or she is going to reduce taxation, and the motivations behind that. Obviously, one of the motivations being that to deliver public services, to drive the economy, you need finances. So that's the main driver. The other purposes of taxation is to shape uh, public policy and to shape public behaviour. If you think of taxation on smoking uh, and consumption of alcohol, it's about shaping public behaviour. But here we have a process which is not about any of those. It's about a process of using very limited resources to be divvied up among the various departments as best we can. And one of the, the, the roles, obviously, of the committee is to scrutinise how departments spend their budgets. And I've seen this from both sides of the fence as a member of a scrutiny committee and also as a minister. I used to come into the House as Education Minister with the budget, and quite rightly I'd be asked questions about how you're spending it, and people would read out a list of priorities, and I would say to them, there's £1.9 billion pounds there. Divide it up as you wish, but that's all that's there. So it's about priorities, and everybody, political parties and individuals will have different priorities, I accept that. So it's about priorities. But if you have, at that instance, we had £1.9 billion, pounds, and members would ask me questions about what we need to do with this, or what are we going to do about that, and we need to spend money on that. But we still come back to the pot, £1.9 billion. How are you going to spend that? The Finance Minister has a considerable amount more than that, but it is about how you divide up a certain pot. And I have no doubt as this debate goes on, members will stand up and say, we need to spend money on A, B, C and D, and this is a very worthy cause, and that's a very worthy cause. And Mr O'Toole, who's left the, the building or left the chamber, has mentioned newspapers, which is always a good way to get your name into the newspapers to offer them money. But there's another good cause. But here's where the rub comes, and here's where the maturity of politics. You hear commentators, and sometimes they find it offensive, and sometimes I, I'm prepared to give them some leeway on it. Politics needs to mature. Some of our commentators need to mature, but that's another matter. So if my politics is going to mature, the day and hour we come into this chamber and we start talking about how we raise taxation, not an individual piece of taxation, how we raise it, but taxation in general, how we gather income into the coffers, now there is going to be a challenge. Because you either tax A, B or C, or you reduce tax, or you find a new tax, and you have to have a motivation for that taxation. So there is a need for the executive to have the levers to allow the finance minister to properly fund public services, and also for the executive as a whole to drive the economic recovery that is required after COVID-19 and the implications of COVID-19. So the next debate, the mature debate, has to be about how we set up and, and, and bring forward to this executive fiscal powers. I will. I'm grateful to the member for giving way. I, I came back into the chamber. I had to pop out for a minute. I'm really glad he's talking about this because I agree with him on it. Would he agree with me that for a body with new fiscal powers to be created, it also has to have economic forecasting responsibilities? It can't just be narrowly focused on um, the revenue raising and spending side. Well, the exact scope of, of, of a commission I, I'm not particularly angst about. Um, I, I do have concerns sometimes when bodies are established and they have economic forecasting powers that they, rather than the elected politicians, direct the economic process. So that's always a fine, fine balance there, but I accept uh, the, the theory in which he refers to. So 
I, I look forward to the debate where uh, we stand up and we talk about what taxation is being gathered. I will, yes, then. Yeah. Um, obviously, this is a discussion that we need to have around revenue raising. But does the member not also agree that the next discussion we also need to have is how we spend our money? And we have taken apart our health service to deal with COVID-19. Is it legitimate to then put it back without implementing Bengoa? Well, you see, that goes back to the point I was making earlier on when I was on the other side of the fence when I was a minister. I came onto the chamber and I said, I have £1.9 billion. Pound. How do you want to spend it? So we know how much money we have currently. And there's nothing stopping either an individual, a political party, or a committee coming forward with alternative proposals. Not necessarily to the budget immediately, but in terms to uh, departmental plans moving forward. So if individuals, parties, committees have alternatives, bring them forward. And that's as much a challenge to my party as it is to everybody else in the chamber, because we know what we have. How do we spend it? Uh, I just want to quickly wind up in terms of I don't, I don't wish to repeat yesterday's debate in terms of economic recovery, uh, but the points have been made around a fair recovery, a green recovery, uh, a recovery that sees those frontline workers who, who we have relied on over this last number of weeks and months properly resourced and paid. But that all brings me back to taxation. So that's the next big challenge, in my opinion, for this assembly and the body politics in this society. Who we tax, how we tax, why we tax and then what we spend it on. So thank you. I call Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. And uh, as my colleagues already said, we are supporting. Um, I heard what Mr Frew said, and I would prefer that all of that information is given to us at the right time. I don't know all of the reasons, but as weeks go by, there is no doubt that uh, we would, I would prefer that we were able to move on as well and do the job which I was elected to, which is to scrutinise what comes before us. Do you know, with, uh, I note the Minister's rationale, and I've, I've said it previous on the 80% uh, uh, to spend, and how confident is he? Again, I'm raising the point that this is to serve the departments up until the end of October, that we aren't creating a massive financial uh, stress for departments for the last five months. So there may well, I would say there will be other budgets. I don't know. I'm not the expert. I haven't got the crystal ball in order to come out or to try and do this. But the, the, I know that there is money, and looking down through it, held back from infrastructure. And that money, uh, if we are going to drive our economy on, we need that spend. There are those in business, there is the accountant. That, that, just to give a term, who will save a million pounds in order uh, to set the books right for a million. But there's also the salesman who will spend that million in order to make an extra million. And I hear what they're saying about the taxational powers, and I too would welcome that debate, and I'm up for that debate. Everyone in this chamber is aware of the financial stresses uh, that we're under, and I'm pleased that the Minister announced that extension uh, to, from the rates holiday, and I, I, I congratulate him for that, and I think that we as a a committee sent him a letter stating that at that time as well. Uh, I want to approve the funding. Uh, uh, early warnings of the spending pressures they are so vital to us. And if the Minister could see that those warnings come to us as the committee as quickly as possible, so as, not, as we scrutinise, we can also share that burden and share that heavy lifting which has to be done. Uh, and I would ask the Minister and his department to see that they are furnished with us as quickly as possible. So if we have got up and running, we have been chasing our tails with this budget process. We are now about to put a second bill through here, which is happening. It is an accelerated passage with the hope of a further bill to be brought forward in this autumn. How confident is the Minister that we can get ahead of the process uh, to allow this important high level of scrutiny that needs to take place? Finally, I would like to mention the crisis that no one seems to talk about, but I am bringing it up again. We are going to be debating it today, and that is on Brexit. And I hope that we can have a true, honest, debate around Brexit because it does warrant. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Sean Lynch. I get the last can call you, and I raise the member of the committee to support the bill also. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, we face the unprecedented public expenditure situation as a result of COVID. The scale, timing and pace of the COVID crisis did not allow for the normal budget processes to be carried out meant that statutory orders had to be 
suspended and allowed for accelerated passage of the budget to take place. The reality was that departments had to deal with emerging public health crisis and get funding out the door as quickly as possible. And sometimes it took days and what it would take weeks. And I want to commend the Minister for getting that money out the door as fast as possible. And there are many businesses and people out there who appreciate that. As we have arrived at the final stage of this bill, the bill is required now that ensure public services can continue to be delivered during this COVID-19 response period. And as we emerge from the lockdown, it will ensure that the health service is supported businesses the most vulnerable are protected. As we know, as others have said, as we move forward and see some light at the end of the tunnel, a new concept has emerged, the new normal. As we reflect back on the old normal, there are many things that exist are not something that we should be seeking to return to. For example, the underfunding of vital services, pursuing the policy of austerity, how we treat and support our frontline workers, the zero contract uh, issue. In a society where a percentage of, uh, of people, a low percentage of people own 90% of the wealth, where CEOs of major organisations, both public and private, earn millions in bonuses, where huge inequalities exist, and the wealthy, those who earn the, uh, the most and those who earn the least, has massively exacerbated. There are and will be better ways of doing things. We should reflect on the lessons learned from COVID. We're facing financial challenges, as my colleague here has said there a number of minutes ago, as we move forward. We already had uh, a pressure from the budget situation. As we know now, over, as we know over that time, the pressures in the public services have increased. The British government has also reneged on some of its responsibilities in the new day new approach agreement. The reality is that all those financial challenges remain and we must all make the argument for further investment in our public uh, services. Services that have been vital during this public health crisis. Services that were stripped bare during 10 years of austerity. As a recovery, uh, recovery budget plan is debated and formulated, we will oppose any attempt to implement an austerity road to recovery. Evidence over the past decade shows that austerity is counterproductive to building an economy, certainly, one, uh, certainly a notion of a fair economy. We should strive for sustainable employment and improved working conditions for many of our low-paid uh, low workers, particularly those in the front line who have been pivotal during this period of the pandemic. I have heard nurses over the past week saying, stop the clapping and give us a decent salary and recognition for work we have carried out. The Minister has spoken about how he has asked departments to look at major capital projects, projects such as McGee Medical School, Casement Park and the F5, and sh should I add the new proposed health care centre in Listen Ski, a project I have argued for many years. And no doubt there are many other projects that could be expedited and be key drivers in the economic recovery. Something we have learned from this pandemic and through this budget process is that decisions and measures can be taken quickly. I support the final stage of Will. Gurramayagut. I call Mike Nesbitt. Uh, Deputy Speaker, thank you very much. Um, as ever, Mr O'Dowd makes some very interesting and challenging points. Uh, and while I'm not going to support him, in terms of uh, what he was talking about with regard to taxes in, in this speech, I would certainly welcome the debate. Uh, and I would agree with him that a measure of the maturity of the devolved administrations would be whether we were capable uh, and trusted with taking on decision making with regard to taxes. But as Mr O'Toole says, surely we shouldn't be doing that without some sort of independent assessment uh, of budgetary forecasting. Uh, much like the Office of Budgetary Responsibility in London. And indeed, for some years now, we have committed to a similar body uh, called the Fiscal Council, uh, most recently in New Decade, a new approach which would have an independent view on our finances, and which I have certainly argued uh, should also take an independent look uh, at how we deliver on the programme for government, because if we're going from out to outcomes-based approaches, these have to be measured. 
Uh, there must be data, but that data can be manipulated, so I think it is important uh, that we are mature enough uh, to bring in experts who are independent, uh, who can mark our homework and say whether a department who says we have done what we said we've done has actually delivered on that. And as one example, Deputy Speaker, if you allow me to roam this far, uh, in the last mandate there was a commitment to giving preschool places uh, to, to families with children under four. And at one point, the executive was claiming a success rate of over 90%, over 90%. But if you drill down into that statistic, you find, for example, in my constituency, a family from Newton Arts was being offered four hours a day uh, in a facility at Suffolk and West Belfast. So by the time they got there, left off the child and got home, it was time to collect. So it was of no use to them, so they didn't avail of it. But it was a success. It was part of the 90-plus success. So I think we do need independent assessment. But we also need scrutiny. And I noticed that Mr. O'Dowd brought in a point of order to try and stop Mr. Frew uh, when he was on his theme of the lack of accountability and transparency and full delivery of what the scrutiny committee had asked for. Well, we can't be doing that. We need to be fully open and transparent. And if we are going to go down the road Mr. O'Dowd proposes, and I'm very, very open to the debate, uh, of having some control over how we raise taxes, uh, where we raise them, and how much we raise and how we spend them, then we have to surely be absolutely assured that this chamber and its scrutiny committees are getting full, open, transparent access to the information that we want. Otherwise, we're walking into another RHI. And I will finish, and I appreciate, Deputy Speaker, you're allowing me to stray from the... From the yes, certainly. Having way, and I agree with everything he says. The problem with tax varying powers is that you tend to touch the levers sometimes too much, and they can go both ways. So you can come under political pressure to reduce taxation as, as well as the pain of increasing it. But more so than that, you'd still have a limited pot of money. No matter how much you raise, you still have a, pot, a, a limited pot of money. And it's about the efficiency of that spend as much as anything. As much as having the powers, it's how efficient you can be at spending that money. That is the real scrutinizer that we need to drill down into to make sure money has been spent in the best way. And, and I thank the member for, for his intervention. And, and that is act, exactly why I'm saying today I would welcome the debate rather than back the proposal. Uh, and I do accept it would be a great sign of maturity if we were able to take on those powers and wield them in, in an efficient and effective manner on behalf of our people. Now, I think, by and large, the civil service do a fantastic job, not least at the moment, in the middle of this crisis. But we must remember that there is a culture uh, within the, the civil service, possibly not just the UK civil service, but more globally, uh, of withholding information. Uh, and I was at a retirement party some time ago uh, for a senior civil servant. Uh, and I think the speaker forgot that there were elected representatives in the room, and there were only a couple of us, because he talked about a moment where this person who was retiring had appeared before a committee of parliamentarians in London, and three times in a row had refused to answer the MP's question. And the Speaker said, that put you into rock star status with us in the civil service. So we need scrutiny powers. We need to exercise them. Of course, we need to work with our civil service colleagues, but we must remember that there are some, and there is some degree of culture, that we must break through if we are to get a truly open, honest, transparent, and accountable culture, which is absolutely necessary when we are dealing with money. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, um, Deputy Speaker. I wasn't intending to speak at this stage initially, given that most of the points that I had raised were also discussed at second stage, so I'm not going to rehearse them again. But I want to note the issues that have already been raised by the Chair of the Finance Committee and my colleague on the Justice Committee, Mr Paul Frew, who has passionately and rightly outlined about information not being fully given to some committee members, as well as the lack of scrutiny time on this voting account and budget bill by the Assembly and committees in general, which again have also been highlighted, not even to mention the lack of new decade and new approach priorities. I still recognise that this vote on account and budget bill is simply about cash release in order for departments to front load and stay afloat. 
but I do wish to reiterate that, like I did at second stage, noting the situations that we find ourselves in, that we must never be put in this position again on budgetary matters. There also does seem to be an issue outstanding that is important to mention, one that I have been raising since I first spoke on budgets in this Assembly, but also given yesterday's events and stemming from some members' comments here today on how we spend our money and that others can bring forward ideas. It is in the context of a motion brought by the Minister's party yesterday afternoon around planning for a just economic recovery after the COVID-19 crisis in this Assembly. And we in the Green Party welcomed such debate yesterday and recognised the need to deal with the imbalance that we have in our society and economy now and the need to make it fair for everyone. So it was disappointing that we were not afforded the opportunity to speak on it. However, I will do so today. Well, I will give way. Uh, I thank the member for giving way. Does the member think it's important that alternative voices are heard in this assembly and society, including Green voices, socialist voices and other voices in uh, every single debate? Thank the member for his intervention. I completely agree, given that we have seven members of this assembly, not in the executive. I think it's really important that all of our voices in the not so-called naughty corner are heard. So what we have here in the budget number two bill and the further I will give way. Uh, just as a matter of corner, that's normally the Ulster Unionist Party's position. We are the naughty corner. But thank you. <laughs> Thank the member for his intervention and noting the social distancing arrangements. That's why we've taken up camp here. So what we do have here in the budget number two bill and further vote and account is a package of financial measures designed to keep departments afloat until the autumn. Yet remarkably, it doesn't include any specific allocations related to an economic recovery plan or a fairer and just transition to a more sustainable economy post coronavirus. Does the minister agree that there appears to be a bit of a disjuncture in this regard? We are allocating resources to departments that need it, and rightly so, but as far as I can see from the minimal detail on spending areas, it is unclear how the Executive intends to even resource its recovery plan. Last Friday, the Minister for the Economy published her department's first steps on economic recovery, which again is very light in detail and lacks a clear, coherent vision for our economy when we come out the other side of this crisis. It certainly is not the basis for a Green New Deal or for a just transition. So, what discussions has the Minister had with his counterpart in the Department for the Economy to make sure that any future strategies and stages of economic recovery are adequately resourced? And does he think that this budget bill will have any implications for what was agreed to yesterday? Has there been any bids for resources from the Minister of the Economy that are tied to, be, tied to a fair and just transitional plan or strategy or green stimulus package to make sure that we move towards a more sustainable economy? Or is it the case that this budget number two bill is simply a case of returning to business as usual after the crisis and makes no funding available for what the motion agreed to yesterday seeks to do? What approach is the minister taking when it comes to properly resourcing an economic recovery plan? Of course, we recognise that a fair and just transition to a green, sustainable future is not the, just the responsibility of one minister or one department, but the executive as a whole. Nevertheless, perhaps the Minister could update the House on how the Executive's approach to economic recovery will be adequately resourced, given this Bill, in both the context of yesterday's motion and what we are discussing today in the context of cash allocation. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Jerry Carl. Mr Deputy Speaker, I am not going to speak at length. I have raised fundamental flaws with this Bill ad nauseum, uh, but I think there still are problems around scrutiny and lack of detail. And I think it's quite concerning what Mr Frew uh, raised and probably wouldn't agree on much, but what he, what he indicated and what he raised is very, very concerning. I um, hope he may consider joining me, maybe voting against the bill for that reason, but uh, I guess he probably won't. Uh, and what he raised uh, seems to suggest echoes of RHI all over again, where supposedly everybody learnt a lesson, we were told, uh, very recently. But it appears, from what he, have, what he has uh, suggested or, or implied, that maybe some haven't. I think there's problems uh, in this bill uh, around no economic strategy um, tied to it, which breaks from the past. Uh, no economic strategy which breaks from the politics uh, of austerity. And as I've repeatedly emphasised, uh, there's at least £50 million of, of cuts to our health trusts in the middle, as I emphasise again, in the middle of a global uh, pandemic. And, and I would concur with uh, um, Rachel Woods. It's quite ironic that um, the Minister's own MLAs brought forward a motion just yesterday um, on the need for a just economic re recovery, something that I support and unfortunately didn't get the chance to speak on uh, as well. 
Um, but the Minister's own budget doesn't do anything of the sort. It continues on the old normal. Uh, so when is going to be the break from economic and political orthodoxy? As somebody once said, if not now, then when? And for those reasons, I cannot support the final stage of this budget bill, as there are fundamental problems with the detail in terms of the, lack of, uh, in terms of the cuts to trust for one and the lack of detail in other areas. And ultimately, it does not reflect the role needed um, in ensuring that the state plays a fundamental and a crucial role in supporting people. Every single economist is predicting there is going to be a massive economic recession, the worst in 300 uh, years. But there are no extra measures in this budget bill to support people uh, at this uh, time. So, for those reasons, I will not be supporting the budget bill, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I now call on the Minister of Finance, Conor Murphy, to conclude and wind up the debate on the motion. I want to thank all the members who have expressed their views in the debate today and those who contributed to the debates uh, over the last number of weeks. Uh, I think we have covered every topic, mostly not relating to the budget matters in front of us, but we have certainly covered every topic anyway. Uh, and I have listened with interest and, of course, with different opinions than my own. It is still very useful as the Finance Minister to hear all of the views expressed. Uh, I, the, Chair of the committee, and again, I acknowledge the committee's role in supporting uh, accelerated passage. And this, and I, I said from the outset, uh, and I come back to this point, that this is an unusual method. It is to release more money to departments to take account of the fact that during this very uh, challenging time of a pandemic, the departments may be spending in excess of what we had already released to them. It wasn't about resetting any priorities. It was, it was about actually uh, giving effect to the budget that was agreed on the 31st of March. Uh, no matter how many times I have explained that, it seems that there are people who just don't get that, uh, or perhaps they don't, they don't choose not to get it and want to engage in other debates. Uh, the, can I say I, I accept entirely the Chair's point about the scrutiny role of committees for all the departments, and uh, I have chaired scrutiny committees in my time, uh, and I, I agree with the need for, for information share with committees. And it's something that I, I absolutely believe in, and I'm quite happy to look at all requests uh, for committees. Can I say in relation to the monitoring round, uh, it was made clear that the monitoring round for June coincides with a, a much more significant reprioritisation exercise going around all departments. And because both events, if you like, were taking place at one time, while officials were very happy to go to the committee tomorrow, they may not have the information that the committee would require uh, at that stage and it is more likely to be available next week. Uh, but they will attend the committee tomorrow and they will return to the committee to provide the further evidence as the exercise proceed. And I can assure the committee will be provided with full details of the Department's June monitoring returns and assessment of COVID pressures. And the committee will have the opportunity to review and scrutinise these pressures and take evidence from officials. And this will take place before the Executive considers the Department's returns and makes decisions uh, on the way forward. Uh, I mean, uh, so uh, I, I hope that uh, satisfies the, the committee in terms of that uh, certainty of information uh, to them. Uh, Paul Frew spoke with the zeal of a convert uh, in relation to disclosure, and I'm sure it's not lost in him that today there was further disclosure in relation to matters which were in front of the RHI inquiry, which involved his current chief executive. Uh, and I presume he'll bring the same righteous indignation into his party meetings when they discuss these matters uh, in relation to disclosure of information. Uh, but I suspect he may not be sitting in the position of deputy chair if he does. But there you go. Nonetheless, he has a position in here. Uh, anyway, uh, and of course, I am happy to consider any requests uh, for uh, appropriate information for the committee. And I will, I will look again at the issues. Uh, you know, you've had your chance for your performance, and uh, now I am having my chance to have my say. And as I say, I'd be very interested if you bring the same level of indignation into your party meetings. Uh, and I doubt very much that you do. Uh, I think Matthew too was right to acknowledge uh, civil servants uh, as something that Sean Lynch touched on. Uh, I think the, the speed of decision making, uh, and I know he, he raised other converse points to that, but uh, something which I think is, is a, a lesson for going forward because we had a uh, significant reputation for sluggishness in terms of turning things around uh, and the, the, the way in which people rose to the task. Uh, and I can speak probably obviously most. Uh, with, uh, in relation to my own department and the people that I have worked with there over the last number of months, but the way people rose to task and the, the, the uh, willingness to take 
risk and to get matters resolved quickly and to get support on the ground to meet a very, very challenging and serious situation, I think, is commendable. Uh, that, of course, requires scrutiny and, and, and things you can't lose uh, propriety in, 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 in attempting to achieve haste. Uh, but I think there is a lesson there in future in terms of how quickly uh, the system here can respond to political priorities when they are developed and can uh, be, be much more efficient uh, in terms of, of its approach. Uh, I, I agree with them in relation to the need for a joined up approach and any of the significant interventions we did in relation to COVID money were done uh, with the three main themes, which was support for public health, uh, support for business and support for vulnerable people. It was under those three broad categories that the Executive agreed that we issued, and, and most of the allocations were done uh, in sizable portions so that we could bring all of those uh, bids into that template and, and allocate accordingly, and those had the agreement of the Executive. I, I agree with them in terms of uh, people going out with their own positions, but we can't censor all our ministers. We can, uh, we can uh, criticise them, but we can't censor them. People aren't, uh, have the ability to go out and, and issue their own view on things. Uh, but nonetheless, I think there has been in a very challenging situation, which the, no executive has experienced here before, and certainly this executive, when it got back in place on the 11th of January, facing very significant challenges, and people have outlined them in terms of austerity, in terms of Brexit, in terms of five-party coalition and managing those relationships, uh, was hit with this pandemic. And I think it is recognised that it has performed admirably uh, in trying to meet those across all of the parties who are in the executive. Uh, he, he raised, and others, others raised as well, both Mike Nesbitt and John O'Dowd, uh, in relation to the idea of a fiscal commission. And uh, Of course, uh, I have said many times that I support that, and the commi commitment to a fiscal council is also made in various agreements. Uh, we had, as all departments had, suspended an awful lot of activity, uh, including some of the NDNA uh, things which were to be developed uh, to meet the challenges that were immediate to us. Uh, over the last number of weeks, we have been getting back to picking up those pieces, including that piece of work uh, in relation to that. And those are big debates that John O'Dowd alluded to them as well. And as I say, I did Mike Nesbitt. But interestingly, uh, Mike, as a former leader of the Ulster Unionist Party, uh, was talking about whether we have the maturity to reach or to take these decisions and to handle these matters. And I, it, it brought me, cast my mind back to his predecessor, Ray Gempe, who was making exactly the same comments when we were debating the transfer of police and justice powers to the Assembly, that the, perhaps the Assembly did not have the maturity to handle police and justice issues. And I would contend anybody who is long enough, it is probably one of the least uh, controversial departments that we have had since its transfer. So I think sometimes we have to back ourselves. Uh, in order to, to test ourselves to see whether uh, we are able to ma manage these things. Uh, the, uh, I, I, uh, just in a final point, uh, Matthew O'Toole made about local media, and I have been considering that matter, uh, and I will give it some uh, urgent consideration. I do recognise the problems that he has, has raised and, and others have raised with me as well, uh, and, and I, do, I, I think our local media play a very important role. Uh, and I do think that we would want to see where it's possible to ensure that they get support. Uh, so we are certainly looking at that issue. Andrew Moore raised the issue of multi-year budgets, and of course we've expressed a desire to get that. That's going to require the outcome of the spending review. The spending review was to have happened over the course of the summer uh, in Westminster and Whitehall, but it's now happening, we're told, in the autumn. Uh, so, following on from that, it will give us a clearer position as to how we can uh, move uh, towards all of that. I think Pat Catney is gone now, but he did ask about sureties of having a, a further budget bill. And as I said, I have committed to that and a much more, uh, much more, uh, I think, in-depth scrutiny run up to that uh, for committees uh, in, the, in the run up to a budget bill in the early autumn. Uh, so I can give him that assurance. Uh, the, uh, both, uh, I think Rachel Woods and Jerry Carroll made similar points. Uh, Rachel has gone out, but uh, this exercise, and as I said at the start, it doesn't matter how often I have repeated that, it doesn't seem to have, have landed. Uh, this is when we agreed the budget on the 31st of March, which was set pre pandemic, and we voted on a vote to account to allocate some money to allow departments to spend up to a certain period of time. The experience of the pandemic has meant that some of that money may run out earlier than a cent could be given to the bill. So it was necessary to bring in a device. And this exercise over the last number of weeks has simply been a technical device to make sure departments have had money. It's not a full-scale budget. It's not a response to the pandemic. It's not a new departure in terms of uh, supporting fair and balanced and green uh, economic recovery. This is the budget we agreed on the 31st of March that was set pre-pandemic. So it didn't take account of what we were facing into. And therefore, it can't then develop 
because we're simply voting to allocate more, more money in that regard, it can't take into account. So the, 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 the tests that people have said it, and I'm happy to repeat that if, if, if it's a genuine misunderstanding, but it was never intended to be the budget that you're looking for, or indeed that Mr Carroll has criticised. And uh, I hope that in the last telling of this tale uh, in relation to this piece of legislation that finally lands uh, and people understand that this is simply a device to allow us to spend more money and to ensure that departments don't run out of money. Uh, a budget that we agreed pre-pandemic could not possibly respond to the situation in the pandemic. And of course, the, the executive will discuss uh, economic recovery, and we will try and develop our, our, and, uh, our plans as best we can with the resources we have, and if there's more available. Uh, and certainly, we will be bringing ideas such as the ones debated yesterday to that discussion on economic recovery. That it is fair, that it is green that it is uh, set in a way uh, that can give hope to people and support to those who undoubtedly will face into economic hardship as a consequence of the pandemic. Those are the arguments as one party of five parties in the executive uh, we will be bringing to the table, uh, and I hope to hear the arguments from other ministers. Last count, Corda, uh, in conclusion, I have tried to respond to as many of these issues as possible, and they have been very varied over the course of the several debates in relation to this legislation. Uh, but uh, there the, the, the has been, nonetheless, a significant debate on this bill and the associated supply resolution. So, in conclusion, I'll ask in court, it's imperative that the legislation debated uh, today completes its passage through this Assembly to secure the cash and resources needed so that public services here can be delivered as we begin, hopefully, to emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic. I ask members to support the bill. Before we proceed to the question, I would remind members that as this is a budget bill, cross-community support is required. The question is that the budget number two bill do now pass. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary no. no. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary no. no. Clear the lobbies. The question will be put again in three minutes. And can I uh, remind members that they should continue to uphold social distancing and members who have proxy voting arrangements uh, in place should not come into the chamber. Order members, can members take their seat? Order members. Before I put the question, I would again remind members present that, if possible, it would be preferable if we could avoid a division. <clears throat> the question is that the Budget No. 2 Bill do now pass. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary no. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary no. I am hearing ayes from all sides of the House. I am satisfied that the necessary uh, cross-community support has been demonstrated. Uh, the motion is agreed. The motion is agreed. Could I ask members to take their ease for a few moments?